As a kid, I wasn't violent. I was a sissy. Like I said, a mama's boy. I didn't have brothers to beat me up, teach me how to fight. I had to learn how to be violent all on my own. And it wasn't just, you know, learning what to do. It was learning the attitude that goes along with it and accepting it as a way of life. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. You have to learn how to defend yourself. That's just the way it is. I made myself strong and fast and dangerous. I turned myself into one big, mean, badass Chinese-American man. Somebody called me a slant, boom, I'd take him out. Somebody called my friend a gook, boom, I'd destroy them. Once at work, a guy called me a Chinaman. I threw a chair across the room, and I jumped on him, and I beat him until he apologized. It's not worth it. You have to tell yourself, those people are stupid. They're not worth the energy, because they're not. I stand up for myself with my words. I don't attack. I try to educate. I say, excuse me, but that's a very offensive remark. Excuse me, but we don't eat dogs. Excuse me, I'm not a boy, I'm a man. It hurts you either way. I don't believe in fighting, but I got mad once. So mad it scared me. I was having a picnic with my girlfriend, and these guys started tossing a football over our heads. There was plenty of room for them to play elsewhere, so I asked them to move. And then one of them called me a slope head. You ever heard that? It has a real nasty sound to it. Well, I just went off. I was in the guy's face so fast, even though I was surrounded by his friends, I was screaming, who are you calling slope head, you motherfucker? Come on, I'll kill you. Finally, his friends pulled him away and they left. But all day long, I was ranting, God damn it, God damn it. Why did he have to say that to me? My father was a quiet man with a lot of pride. I respected him. He told me, let it roll off your back or you'll carry it on your back. I understood what he was saying, but it's a hard thing to do. Racism made me the way I look, the way I walk, the way I talk. It's all formulated as a response to racism. I am a product of my environment. I had this distrust of whites. I didn't believe that it was possible for them to understand the minority experience. It wasn't until law school that I had a white friend. I saw how committed he was to civil rights issues, how much he cared, and I realized, hey, there are some who are solid from the heart, and we became friends. Although I had plenty of experiences to verify my hostilities, I realized my prejudice was wrong. Becoming a lawyer was a big thing for my family. From the first day of law school, my parents went around telling people that I was an attorney. I couldn't let them down. I remember when I passed the bar, couldn't wait to tell my dad. I went to the building where he worked. I ran up the steps. I opened the door. And, uh, and there he was. He was polishing the lobby floor. It broke my heart. He looked up and he smiled and I walked over to him. And I could hardly get it out without crying. I remember what he said. He said, I'm so happy, Danny. Now you don't have to be like your father. A Korean drum group called Samul Nari came to town, and I took my wife, who is Japanese-American, and also adopted. Even though I didn't understand what the music meant, it affected me deeply. 
at the end of the concert, they did this wild circular dance, and they invited the audience to join them. So I jumped onto the stage. I don't know if it was some kind of primal connection or that I was just so starved for anything Korean, but it was very emotional for me. Dancing with them, I felt this incredible joy that I can't describe. When I came home from Vietnam, I was pretty screwed up. I spent the first eight months in bed and the next five years in and out of bars and in a lot of bad relationships. I had an uncle in Hawaii who was a veteran who I guess was relating to what I was going through and he offered me a job. I had nothing going so I took it. It was a good move. In Hawaii, the Asians, they're not a minority. They don't do that, you know, minority thing. Where you walk around, you know, like you're afraid of getting hit or something. The Asians, they walk with pride. First week I was there, I saw these young brothers standing at the beach, carefree and confident. And I remembered. I used to be like that. And I started to cry. My uncle said, You made it through Vietnam, yeah? You can make it through this. Just let us help you. He found me a therapist. And he took me fishing. Which is pretty good therapy, too. And I started doing volunteer work at a youth center, talking to troubled kids. And slowly, I got myself back. And I let the anger go. I went to Korea, not to find my real parents, but to find a place where I could belong. It was scary, but it was exciting. Just standing in the streets surrounded by people that looked like me was exhilarating. I could pretend I belonged. If I didn't open my mouth, they thought I was Korean. Of course, when I did, they said, you're not Korean, you're American. Your name is James Michael Johnson. So I float. I was born in Korea, but I have no roots there. I grew up in America, but I'm not welcome here. I just float. That's what being Asian American feels like. It's how you walk through your life. I meet Asian Americans who have stopped being Asian Americans. They've forgotten the sacrifices that their parents and their grandparents made. They don't give back to the communities they came from. They've got their cars and their houses and their good jobs. And, and they think that they can create a comfort zone where racism doesn't affect them. They're living in denial. They read these newspaper stories and, and, and they think, well, that doesn't affect us. They read about some Southeast Asian kid who gets his head bashed in with a baseball bat and they think, well, we're not Vietnamese. I've mellowed out a bit. You know, my testosterone level has come down. I, I, I've learned how to control my rage. But I still will not stand by while another Asian American, or for that matter, any underdog, is attacked because of their race, religion, or sexual orientation. I will not do that. You see, these Asian Americans who think they're safe, 
who, who think that, that all this Asian bashing and hatred and violence has nothing to do with them. They're not Asian Americans, they're something else. You see, to me, saying that you're an Asian American, you see, that, that means something to me. It means you carry a sense of pride and solidarity when you say it. Don't give that up. Los Angeles, California. Japanese American Girl Scouts selling cookies in front of a supermarket are called Japs and told, we only buy from Americans. Yuba City, California. A Laotian restaurant worker is severely beaten for giving two white women a ride home in his truck. Houston, Texas. Hung Truong, a 15-year-old Vietnamese American, is walking to a convenience store. He is stopped by two carloads of white youths who demand to know what he is doing in a white neighborhood. Two of the youths chase him down and beat him with baseball bats 30 to 40 times. Witnesses hear them shouting, white power. Trong dies of massive head injuries. La Crosse, Wisconsin. Two students from Japan are savagely beaten by a group of white males who say they mistook them for Hmongs. Stockton, California. A white male with an AK-47 assault rifle fires 105 rounds into a group of children on an elementary school playground. Five Southeast Asian children ages six to nine die. Local police are quick to announce that the killings are not racially motivated, but further investigation reveals that the killer blamed his personal failings on minorities and vowed to kill every Asian child he could find. Raleigh, North Carolina. Two white men attack Jim Liu, a 24-year-old Chinese American. They say they hate chinks and gooks and blame him for the deaths of Americans in Vietnam. Liu is struck on the head with a pistol. The blow knocks him to the pavement and he falls face first on a broken beer bottle. He dies from severe brain hemorrhaging. Huntington Beach, California. Three middle-aged Japanese American women are beaten in a restaurant as several patrons chant, speak English. Coral Springs, Florida. A 19-year-old Vietnamese American pre-med student at the University of Miami is taunted, then kicked and beaten by a group of 10 to 20 young white males who use the words Viet Cong, Chink, and Sayonara. One witness recounts, I told my daughter to call the police. I looked back and the guys were walking away. Then one of them came back and kicked him four more times. Two days later, the student, Luyen Fan Nguyen, dies from a cerebral hemorrhage. His father says, if my son were a dog, maybe he'd still be alive. People would have said, don't hurt that dog. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 16-year-old Japanese exchange student, Yoshihiro Hattori, knocks on the wrong door, looking for a Halloween party. A woman answers the door and tells her husband to get his gun. The husband shouts, freeze, which the student reportedly does not understand, then shoots and kills Hattori with a 44 Magnum. The killer claims self-defense and is acquitted of all charges. Would that kid be dead if he was white? And would that killer go free if he was a person of color? <laughs> 